Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together. Like party playlists and Friday nights. Campfires and ghost stories. Peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. I just want to jump in here with a quick note about some changes that are happening. This podcast is now going ad-supported. What that means is I will be releasing select episodes from the hundreds of episodes I have archived now on Patreon and releasing them here. A lot of these were recorded a couple of years ago during 2020 especially. However, I have gone through them and deemed that the parenting information was still really relevant. So just be aware that some of these releases may be out of order chronologically. Also, if you would like to listen to the podcast ad-free, you can still join Patreon. I'll still be releasing podcasts there with a few bonuses. One is that it will be ad-free. One will be that you get the podcast slightly earlier than everybody else. And I'll also be doing a bonus episode every month with a Q&A that's patron specific. So if that's something you'd like to do, you can join for a dollar a month and we'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. So today is a little bit different. I'm going to share a couple of personal stories. Well, one main personal story that I think has, first of all, it's a really cool story. It's about me and Pascal. But also I think there's like a lot of lessons, lessons that I learned, lessons that Pascal learned, and hopefully some lessons that maybe you guys will learn as your parenting journey continues. Uh, Let me start off by saying another personal story. So my Maverick got neutered, which means he's got this inflatable collar around him because we can't, absolutely cannot have a cone in my tiny house. (laughs) He would not be able to move. And he got kind of swollen because my dog has zero chill. He's an eight-month-old puppy, but on top of that, you know, he's used to running for like six miles a day. So he moved too much. And so the vet said he needed a stronger sedative. So he's on two sedatives walking into walls. And it's kind of sad and funny. (laughs) But anyway, I can't wait to have my dog back because as much as it's nice to have a dog that sleeps all day, it's still not, you know, the puppy that I had that was running with me (laughs) six miles a day. On that note, I am still running. I'm training for the Spartan Trifecta which is a sprint, a super, and the beast. And if you've heard of these, the beast is on Mount Killingly, which is a ski mountain. It's anywhere from 13 to 17 miles up and down the mountain with something like 36 obstacles. So super hard, very challenging, but I'm training and training and training. And it's so freaking humid here. I feel like I'm complaining about the bugs on every podcast, but in case I haven't complained in a while, I'm just getting eaten alive. And so it's just so humid and kind of wet. And so we had all that rain and now it's just mosquito central and spider central. So anyway, I'm suffering. And right now I think that's the hardest part of training is not getting stronger, but the bugs. But also if you hear me itching or thwapping mosquitoes, like even in my house right now, it's a little bad. I just killed one right now. It's all, it was all full of blood. So it must've already gotten me. (laughs) Okay. On to the story. This is the story of Pascal and I going to see Green Day in the Hella Mega Tour. And it's a whole story. So let me lay some groundwork before I tell that story. So, you know, as you guys know, last year, mid pandemic, we moved to the woods 
I've always homeschooled, so homeschooling was not big, but it was hard during the pandemic because like all our homeschooling, just like everybody else, our tools were taken away from us. And so like being social was really hard. And if you recall the drama of my best friend at the time and I divorced and her four kids were largely part of Pascal's social scene. So it got really tricky. And now we live where we live is like pretty much 45 minutes from anywhere. So I've just kind of made peace with the fact that I drive a lot and that's how it goes. Well, Pascal's two best friends, two guy friends live 45 minutes away. They live in a town called North Kingstown, which is 45 minutes away from my town, which is Chapachet. And so it's been challenging because he wants to see his friends and they want to do things like at night. And so I end up driving and these parents don't help with the driving and it's kind of a bitch. And it's just one of those situations though, where I think because they go to school, like their social scene is kind of built in, you know, so the parents don't feel obligated to Pascal, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. I guess it's a little more than it is. I'm a little, I'm a little resentful about it, but the reality is I want my kid to have his social time. And so I have to make it happen. Now, this summer, I'm going to call them Joe and Mike, because I don't want to say their real names, but (laughs) Joe went to a very intense music camp where there was no outside contact and Mike stuck around. Now, Mike just graduated high school, so he's 18. He is off to college next year, and that will factor into the story. (laughs) But his parents are like super duper overprotective. He drives and they won't let him drive as far as my house, which is what it is. But they... A couple of weeks ago, this kid slept over my house and his mom called me to go over his food allergy. He's celiac and, you know, wanted to talk to me about him being celiac. Now I get it. Food allergies are hard, especially ones that make a kid really, really sick, like anaphylactic or celiac. But but I was like, this kid's 18. So here's lesson number one for you guys. Teach your child to advocate for themselves because by the time they're 18 and going to college, really your mom shouldn't be calling people. And so... (laughs) There's my judgment, number one. There's her lesson. So anyway, now these kids wanted, um, they're they're all musicians. They compose music together on FaceTime. It's really, really cool. And I, I love these kids, you know, even though I think their parents are, I get very resentful. I think it's unfair that I do all the driving. But again, I always weigh every single time with like, I want Pascal to have fun and I go to bed so early. It's really hard for me sometimes to go pick him up at like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. But I really, I try to rally because teenage friends, in-person friends are just so, so, so important. And so I do what I got to do. And a lot of times though, when Pascal is making the plans, I'll be like, I, I, I'm really honest with him about weighing out the resentment. Cause I'm like, buddy, I don't want to be resentful because he has seen what happens when I get resentful, which is I'm psycho mom, like any other mom, right? I, I'm trigger happy. I go off on the slightest thing or I make mountains out of molehills because I let that resentment about the driving build up. So there are days where I've, I've been like, bud, you're going to have to be disappointed. This was, you know, you guys decided too fast. I didn't have a chance to take a nap or whatever. I mean, I really have to prepare for these like pickups <laughs> 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So that's sort of the backstory. So now they all wanted to see Machine Gun Kelly, who's playing in September. And, you know, we figured out how to make that happen. And even concert tickets, you guys, are so expensive. So that was Pascal's birthday present. It was a big deal. And I had to factor in that I'm probably going to be driving, right, these kids. So I was like, all right, that's cool. I have plenty of of advanced time. And right after those Machine Gun Kelly tickets went on sale and we bought them, you know, again, for his birthday, there were tickets for the Green Day, the Hella Mega Tour announced. And so Pascal was like, oh my God, I love Green Day. Now, mind you, he plays the drums. He's been playing the drums since he was six years old. He transposes all of Green Day songs. So if you're not a musician, what that means is he listens to the music and writes out the music. It's it's an arduous task. It takes hours and hours and hours. And one of the reasons I had him take drums is because drummers who read music are a hot commodity. I was a performer for years and drummers largely play by ear. But if you have a situation like the Philharmonic or, you know, something like that, I know like on Broadway, a drummer who reads music can fill in just about anywhere. So I was like, dude, I'm giving you like a plan B here with the drums, right? So 
Anyway, he's crazy about Green Day, even more than Machine Gun Kelly. So I said, well, you're going to have to pay for the tickets yourself. There's no way I'm paying for two concerts back to back. And then hours later, he's like, forget it. They're sold out. So they were sold out on their website, on the Green Day website, right? Which is obviously they buy the tickets. They're playing at Fenway Park, which is in Boston, which is an hour and a half away from us. So it passed, it never occurred to Pascal to go to the Fenway website. So I was like, all right, cool. Well, they're sold out. Nothing you can do about it. Maybe next time. So then fast forward to August 4th. It's a Wednesday evening. And I mean, like 4.30. And he happens to go on Fenway. So he's like, mom, I think they're not sold out. So I go on Fenway's website and sure enough, there's, there's tickets available and good, good ones too, you know? So I was like, all right, we'll figure it out, buddy. Now this is happening Thursday, August 5th. So he's got approximately 24 hours to figure this out. The concert starts at five, which is bizarre, but whatever. <laughs> and so, and you know, if I'm going to drive to Boston, which I'm probably going to drive to Boston, then we have to look at an hour and a half. So he's got to figure this shit out by three the next day. So him and his friends are talking and they're really trying to make it happen. And this one kid, Joe, just got back from camp and he's like, I don't, he doesn't have a job. So he's like, I can't, my parents will kill me if I try to soak out another concert ticket. And then the other kid is like, yeah, I really want to go, but my parents can't drive again. So I was like, all right, there's no way, Pascal, there is no way that I can drive from here to Fenway back home to hang out for a couple hours to then drive back to Fenway to drive back home. Now, I'm also having to factor in the parents don't even want to get that kid, Mike, to my house. Now, he's another 45 minutes away, which adds another half hour to Boston. You guys, I'm looking at like seven to eight hours of driving in a 10-hour span. (laughs) So I was like, there's no way I can do it. And I can't leave Maverick. Um, I don't want to leave Maverick alone because he had just gotten neutered. He's on these drugs. And I didn't want him in the car with us. And I couldn't really, you know, stay in Boston with a dog that's, you know, drugged. So I was like, it's not even like I could go out for a nice dinner or something and hang out. So all of that's just going on. And then I'm like, oh, wait, how about an Uber? I've had Pascal take Ubers before and it's worked out really, really well. And so he's like, oh, yeah, we could take an Uber. I said, listen, I'll even drive you all to Boston. But then you take an Uber home. And he's like, yeah, that's perfect. Calls this kid. Mike, who again is 18 going into college and the parents are like, no, he can't take an Uber. We don't feel safe with that. And again, I just have to bitch a little (laughs) because I'm like, your kid's going to drink till he pukes next year. Like, do you understand what happens your first year of college? And like, you, you called me six weeks ago to talk about him being celiac and now he can't take an Uber home from a concert. So I was irritated, even though whatever, parents have their own view, you know, their own opinion of safety, whatever. But I still was like, well, Pascal, that was the last, you know, that was kind of the last hope. So then in the morning, I go to do my workout with my girl. So this is on Thursday morning. And she's like, oh my God, my husband loves Green Day. So I was like, oh, do you think he could take the boys? And she was like, oh, let me ask him. He's a dad. He's got three boys and a high tech job. And he had meetings and he couldn't, he was really disappointed, but he couldn't. So one by one, like things are it's just not working out. I call my nephew. I even call some like musician friends. I'm like, you know, anybody who's going to green day. And so like the time is ticking on Thursday and it's just, it's not going to work out. And I'm like, Pascal, I'm sorry. I just, I can't do this. I would be, I'd just be such a bitch to you. I know I would. And it would just wear me out. I'd be way too tired to drive home. It'd just be a nightmare. And he's like, no, I get it, mom. But he is so fucking sad. Like so sad. In a sadness that's not pouting, that's not trying to get his way. And he's not a spoiled kid, you know? Actually, he's kind of spoiled, but he's not entitled. He's spoiled because he's like my only kid and I have disposable income. But he's not, he's not entitled. And I certainly don't think, I never do things if I think I'm being manipulated, if I think he's really trying to get his way. I just, I won't, you know? And I am the kind of mom who is like, sometimes you're disappointed and that sucks. And he definitely, you know, like I put it on Instagram, he has three summer jobs, all really heavy manual labor. He's apprenticing for a construction company. He is bailing hay, which is the hardest job in the world. And he works as a farm hand, shoveling like chicken shit out of coops. So all very intense manual labor in the humidity with the bugs. So, you know, he's not the kid who's like, 
just sitting around getting his way. But he is he is heartbroken and it starts to like really pull up my heart because I just I've never really seen him quite that sad. You know, maybe that time he fell in love. But anyway, he starts talking to you. He's like, can one of does do can any of your friends take you know, because he was like, can I go by myself? I'll take an Uber by myself. And I was like, you can't go to a concert by yourself, Pascal. Like if there's a fight or there's a fire, you're 15 years old. Like, no, I can't. And I can't have you take an Uber by yourself to Boston. Like if something happens, you're so far from me. So he's like, just keep, he keeps trying to find a way. And what I realize is it's not even about his friends anymore. And it's not even about hanging out. It's really about the music. Like he really wants to see this band. So then he gets in the shower and I can hear him kind of crying and I feel bad. He gets out of the shower and he's like, he's got his shit together, you know? And he's like, hey, there's still a little bit of time. But I know it's four o'clock, you know? And I said, all right. I'm, I said, but there's just, there's nothing I can do. And I was like, don't worry about it. They'll go on tour again. I mean, it's Green Day. They'll go on tour again. And he was like, but I don't know when. And what if they're past their prime? And I know that sounds really funny to you guys, But when he was little, he loved Derek Jeter. And my family's Yankee fans. I don't give a rat's ass, but my Yankees, my family's Yankee fans, and we live in New England, which is Boston Red Sox fans. So he loved Derek Jeter. And I wanted him to see Derek Jeter play. So I got him, you know, I kept kind of procrastinating it. And by the time we saw Derek Jeter play, he was past his prime. He was he was lame. He wasn't playing like Derek Jeter. And I was so pissed because I was like, oh, he could have seen him. You know, we could have seen this guy in his prime. And so when Pascal said that about Green Day, I was like, you know, that's a really valid argument. Like at any given time, these guys might be just a little bit too old to run their shtick, you know, even though Keith Richards is still in concert and really should have died very long time ago, I think. Oh my goodness. So anyway, him and Betty White, right? Hanging in there. So it was a valid argument. And all of a sudden, I don't know why you guys, but it occurs to me the one thing I hadn't factored in is what if I go to the concert? Mostly because I don't know Green Day. I know they're super popular. I know they're like four greatest hits. I know that when I was in San Francisco, I moved to San Francisco in 1990. So that's when they were coming up. And I had friends who like hung out with them, you know, like in their apartment who saw them in their very early days. You know, we had flyers from on the street in our apartment. So I knew them. I knew their long history. But at the time I was doing musicals, I liked Broadway show t- I can tell you who won the Tony in 1994, but I didn't really know Green Day. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, I can't wait to see them. I'll come to the concert with you. So I hadn't factored that in. So I go, wait a minute, it's four o'clock. I said, uh, let's do it. And he, he, the look on his face, you guys, he was like, he bottomed out, like his heart bottomed out. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, let's do it. I'll go to the concert with you. I said, I'm exhausted, but I'll just, I'll take a couple of caffeine pills. I'll have a Red Bull at the concert. I said, their music's upbeat. I'll dance and and we'll just do it together. And that way I'm not driving as much. You know, I'm only doing that like three hours of driving. And he was like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't even believe this. So I go on, but I was like, we got to go now. It's like 4.15. <laughs> so, and he's starting to panic because he's like, yeah, but the concert starts at five. And I was like, buddy, no concert begins at five. And now it's the Hella Mega Tour. So it was Weezer, Fall Out Boy, and then Green Day. And I said, look, Green Day's the headliner. They're probably not coming on till like at least 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Fall Out Boy had to cancel. They tested positive for COVID. So then it was just Weezer. And I said, with just two bands, I can guarantee they're going to stretch it out. Don't worry about it. We have time. So we hit the road. So funny. Uh, we take up, oh, and then Maverick. I didn't know what to do with Maverick. So I was like, dude, he had his nighttime meds and he was sleeping. And I was like, I think you're going to be okay. I think you're going to be okay while we're at the concert, which is a big move for me as a doggy mom. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. So we take off, you know, there's traffic because, of course, we're hitting Boston, you know, Rhode Island to Boston, rush hour. We hit some traffic, and but we get there. I said, you know what? 
by the time we get to Fenway, it'll be good. I said, I think we'll be in the stadium by seven. So we get to Fenway exactly on time, 628. I'm like, woohoo, we can hear Weezer in the stadium. And there is no fucking parking, you guys. There's no parking at all. So I was like, going to cry because three mile radius. Now, anytime I've ever gone to Fenway, there's parking, but I'm anal and I arrive at events two hours early, not once the event has started. So we kind of got screwed in that sense, right? No parking, no parking. I keep going out. I'm circling around. I'm circling around. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but driving in Boston is a fucking bitch. It's awful because Boston is, as one of our first like official cities, it's built on a spiral because they didn't have their shit together. Our founding fathers, they didn't know that you build cities in grids. They just kept building it in a spiral. And on that, each spiral, there's like all these little side routes and dead ends. It's awful. And traffic moves so slow. So now we're trying to look for parking and we're like going out and out and out. But the more you go out, the harder it is to get back in. Right. So I start to cry because I am not a yes mom. I I don't yes him at every turn. I am because I think I'm advanced maternal age. (laughs) I seem to have a lot of energy, but I am tired. I'm a tired mom. So I'm not the mom who's like, yeah, let's like do a spontaneous, you know, picnic for dinner. Like I, that's just not, that's not who I am. And it's definitely not who I am in his teenage years. I am, I'll do what I have to do, but (laughs) I'm a pretty quiet person and I'm not a yes person. So now I start to cry because I am like, did I say yes? And I'm going to be thwarted by parking. I mean, it looks like we're going to have to leave the city and maybe take an Uber in. That's how bad it is. And time is now ticking, right? So I am on the verge of tears. And I was like, no, this isn't how it goes. And Pesco was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I said, I know what to do. So we, <laughs> I go right to a parking lot that's close to the stadium, like the closest. And there's corporate parking, but this is like a little guy with a piece of land parking, Right. He's got the no parking sign. It's $50, but the lot is full. And I get out, I put my hazards on and I run up to him and I was like, I'll give you triple if I, if you can squeeze me in. He moves his parking sign. He's like, come on in. (laughs) So I get my money out and he, he looks at me and he's so Bostonian. He's like, I can't fucking burn you. Come on, just pay the regular price. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? So I did end up giving him 80 because I was like, just thank you. (laughs) And (laughs) And, uh, I just, I was so happy. We run to the stadium. Pascal can't even believe it. Like he can't believe we're even in. Green Day's not even close to playing. We still have plenty of time to get merch. We have plenty of time to get a hot dog and and a Red Bull and it's all good. But another lesson, one thing I'm really struggling with Pascal right now is he, and this is, this is his generation. It's a Gen Z thing. He'll go, I don't know. Like I'll ask him of something or he won't know how to do something. He's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, you, you're the generation that was born with the internet. Like, you don't have to go to the library and look it up in an encyclopedia like I did. <laughs> but he'll say, I don't know. And I was like, that's not an acceptable answer. Find out. Like, we, you can Google anything. You can YouTube anything. Find out. And so one thing I just loved about the parking situation was, but ask. Ask for the impossible. Also, have disposable income. So you can pay $80 extra. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, there, I'm not, I know I'm extremely privileged in that sense, but we choose to spend money on events and not, uh, not material things. But I was like that, save your money, save your money so that if this happens to you, you can do that. You're not tied to like the $2 an hour parking that you're not going to find. But also like ask, ask for things. He's terrible about that. He's terrible about like, I said, I've always, I I tell him all the time, just ask. Somebody can say no, but the no shouldn't crush you. And it does, it crushes him. And so he was like, that was the coolest thing. He kept telling his friends, I bribed the guy. I was like, I didn't bribe the guy. I just offered him extra money, you know, which everybody loves extra money. So anyway, we get into the stadium. and, And again, we have a blast. Now, I don't know Weezer at all. So they were good, but Green Day came on and holy fuck, you guys, they were so good. And I mean, they weaved you into a web, like a good performer. I I had a blast. So much fun. We danced our asses off. You know, we, uh, we went and got more food and merch on the, on the, uh, what do you call it? It wasn't like an intermission, but oh, when they were changing the set, when Weezer was changing the set, it was so great because I told Pascal, I said, listen, 
I know you guys love to record stuff, but like recording a live concert is like recording the fireworks on 4th of July. It seems like a really good idea, but you're never really going to go back and look at those again. And, you know, make sure you really plug into the concert. And so it's so cute because I guess Green Day does kind of very similar things every concert. Like they have sort of a layout, you know? And so he knew they opened with Bohemian Rhapsody, which is the best warm up ever. So he said, Mom, can you film them when they come on stage? And I was like, Yeah, why? Is your phone already out of batteries? And he was like, No, I got to be present for this. And so I was super happy about that. I was happy to film. And we had a good, you know, people all around were just loving that he, it, there was a bit of a boomer crowd. I got to be honest, because Green Day's fans are, you know, getting up there. But uh, we ended up having great seats. We could, we were like 50 seats from the stage. I thought the tickets were reasonable for being so close. And anyway, just, we had a blast. And then, um, oh my God, I'm going to cry, you guys. So then at the end, they closed with this, like one of the only songs I know. Um, There's something unpredictable, but in the end, it's right. I hope you have the time of your life. And Pascal looks over to me. I'm going to cry. He goes, Mom, it's like our theme song. This was so unpredictable, but we had the time of our lives. And I was like, oh my God, my 15-year-old son and I have a theme song. Like, <laughs> And I'm thrilled that it's Green Day. <laughs> so um, it, it was just amazing. And so on the way home, he said, what made you change your mind? That like, I can't even tell you guys, we had, this was a pivotal moment in our career. Me saying yes to this changed everything. He wouldn't stop talking to me the whole ride home, just talking about the concert. And then all of a sudden telling me other things that are going on in his personal life that, you know, that he had been not really wanting to share with me and just unbelievable. I like unlocked, I unlocked a a door by doing this. And it wasn't again, just about like giving in. And he kept saying, you know, why did you change your mind? And I said, I don't know. I said, you know, I said a huge portion of it was that I hadn't factored in me staying at the concert. You know, that that was huge because that cut down on a lot of driving. I said, but I started to realize as the day went on and you weren't letting it go and you were super heartbroken, I started to realize that it wasn't about getting an Instagram picture. It wasn't about your friends. It wasn't about bragging rights, that it was like really about the music for you. I said, and I know how important music was to me as a teenager. It means everything. It's, it's your poetry. It's how you express, you know? And I said, I just saw how crazy important it was to you. And he's, he just, he was so grateful and his gratitude, his gratitude wasn't even the regular gratitude. He was like, I just, I, I can never thank you enough for this. And, um, it was just, it was just so lovely. And so the reason, I mean, I'm telling you this story because it's like my new favorite story ever. And I think, again, having unlocked that door into our relationship, I think that's an important part. But I also think a lot of times when you guys ask me questions or write in or something, you know, a thread gets going on Instagram, parents want rules, right? They want rules. And more and more, I think because the world is so unsure, people ask me for scripts. They ask me for like, but what do I do in this situation? And when I work with a family on parenting issues, I always say, listen, I'm, I'm trying to fill your toolbox with things, right? I cannot give you a pat answer that's going to work in every scenario. It just doesn't There are going to be times, there are going to be times your kid sleeps in your bed. There's going to be times that you have ice cream for dinner. There's going to be times that you say yes when it's always clearly a no. And so there was something very locked and loaded. I was calling it with him that day. I just kept watching him and I just felt really in tune and it made me do something so uncharacteristic, so out of my comfort zone, so above and beyond. And I've never been sure of something in my life is when I said, let's do it. Let's, and I, I wanted to be that mom. And, and I think one of the things that made that night such a success was I got to be the mom that I've always wanted to be that I'm not really. And he got to be the kid he really wanted to be. And we were super aligned together. (laughs) And And so for you guys, I want to remind you that when you're unsure, lock and load with your kid, lock and load with the kid who's in front of you. And you'll be, you'll be guided. You'll be guided if you, if you keep 
heart connected with that kid and not try, you know, everything in me was saying, play by the rules, play by the rules, which is your kid's got to be disappointed. This isn't the time to bail him out. And everything in that moment said, nope, nope, I got to make this happen for him. And again, I've really spent an inordinate amount of time pulling this apart because because I I wasn't even sure why I said yes and why I kind of, I went not necessarily against my convictions, but, but like, I just couldn't figure it out. And so I spent time with my friends and really dissecting it. And it comes down to just being so connected and knowing that this was important and I was right. And I can't imagine, you know, that was August... Fifth, I'm recording this on August 12th. And in that week, still, our relationship has been wildly different. And his, my willingness to do that makes his gratitude bigger than it's ever been. And it, it has literally changed our relationship. And so anyway, that's, that's the lesson that, and like be willing to pay extra for parking (laughs) and also let your kid advocate for their own food allergy. (laughs) Um, but yeah, and and now I love Green Day. And he took my phone and he made me a special Green Day playlist. And every other song is one of the popular songs. So so I keep <laughs> I keep interested. But anyway, you guys, I will close with that. And I hope you enjoyed that story as much as I enjoyed living it. And uh, there's something unpredictable, but in the end, it's right. I hope you have the time of your life. Rock on you guys. All right, I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, yummy new book presale treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course, my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified OCRAP consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.